Okay, how are you guys doing? Did you have a good Thanksgiving break? Yes? Are you ready for the last week of classes? Yeah, okay. It's hard to believe it is the last week. But actually next week I will give a, a, a bonus lecture. I will give a, I'll give a review lecture uh, on Tuesday next week. And also I remind you that there is a lot of materials for, um, for the final exam, which are available on BSpace and, and on, also on the class homepage, which I hope by now you know how to find. All right? And now we go back to, to uh, the study of um, um, Stokes' theorem. So we've been um, slowly laying the foundations, the necessary foundations for, for, this, for Stokes' theorem. And finally, it's time to so, 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 sort of to reap the benefits of all of that. And so finally, today, we'll be able to, to, to state the result and to see what it means and what the applications of this result are. Okay? And, um, but first of all, I would like to, um, to revisit the material which we talked about last week, okay? Uh, a week ago. We talked, about, we talked about surface integrals, integrals over the surfaces, okay? And the point was that actually we studied two types of integrals. Two types of integrals over general surfaces um, in the three-dimensional space. As a, as a good working example um, of, of such a surface, we'll, we'll look at the upper hemisphere. It's a surface with a boundary, which is a circle. So you can actually, you can think that there is a, it's actually a part of a sphere which is centered at the origin. So you could also imagine that there is a coordinate system here, x, y, z. And, um, and so the surface, um, what I'm talking about is, the sur is this upper hemisphere, the surface of the uh, upper part of the surface of the sphere, okay, which has a boundary, which is a circle. So what we're trying to understand is how to integrate over such surfaces, surfaces of this type, and relate integrals over such surfaces to integrals over their boundaries. That's the, that is the point of Stokes' theorem. Okay? So let's denote this by M. And M, M, M stands for membrane, because I explained last time that um, integrals over surfaces of the second type can be viewed as, as uh, fluxes over uh, of fl of fluid through membrane. But here, I want to recall that there are two types of such integrals that we have looked at. The first type, the first type, you, you, you pick a function, and then you integrate over the M this function with a measure which we denote by ds. We talked about the interpretation of this. This has to do with the surface area, and more generally with the mass. So this represents the mass of, of, of the surface. Think of the surface as an aluminum, aluminum foil, say. And F is a mass density function, density function. And when you integrate the density function, you get the total mass. It can also be a charge density function. Then you would be integrating total charge. So that's the first type. The important thing here is you integrate a function. And the second type is when you start with a vector field. So it's not a function. It's much more than a function, actually. We represent it uh, by a triple of functions. It has components P, Q, and R, right? Where each of these three is a function of its own, on its own right. In this case, we also have a double integral, which we discussed last time. 
And that's what's called a, a flux also, a flux of a vector field or a, or a surface integral of a vector field, which we denote like this, E dot ds, a ds. Okay, so this is a called, uh, sometimes called flux of E through, through this membrane. And it represents the, the rate of flow of a fluid through, uh, through a membrane M if F is, is the velocity vector field for this fluid. I explained last time. And now, of course, you even, uh, even if you were not here, you can actually watch the lecture uh, on multiple places, which is a good, I think it's a good uh, resource. Okay, so it makes, me, it makes it easier for me to just say, I did it last time, so. If, if it was not recorded, that would be, not, would be a little unfair, but now I know that you, if you don't remember, you can always go back and watch it again. All right. Now, what, uh, how, to, how to compute this? So the key to computing this is to, as well as the other one, is to parameterize the surface. Right? So parameterize it. Which means that we write x as x of some uv and y as some y of uv and z is so, as some function z of uv where u and v are in this belong to a certain domain now on the plane. Parameterize it. Well, when I say parameterize it, I mean parameterize M. And so when you parameterize it, you actually get a, a very explicit formula for, for, this, um, for this integral as a, just a double integral over D. So we get an integral which is now in the realm of the previous chapter of this course something which we studied before, okay? Now, the key to this is the following, that the way we introduced, the way we introduced this integral, we actually wrote it as an integral of the first type. We wrote it as an integral of the first type over M, where what we do is we take a dot product between E and N, where N is, is the unit uh, normal vector field. To this, to this surface. When we do that, when we take the dot product, we convert our vector field into a function. This becomes a function, and that function we can now integrate in the sense of the integral of the first type. So this is how we introduced it. Today I will explain a different way to think about this, where you don't have to, to use the concept of the first, um, of the integral of the first type to understand the integral of the second type. But this actually, this brings, uh, brings up the question as to what this n is, okay, this, this, this uh, normal vector. So in my picture, let me, let me draw this picture again. In my picture, this vector field n would look like this. At each point of the surface, we would have a vector which, is, which kind of sticks out and which is normal, or normal means perpendicular, perpendicular to the surface. If you, have, if you have a surface and you have a point on the surface, you can talk about the tangent plane, right? We talked about this, tangent planes. We even know equations for tangent planes, how to find equations for tangent planes. And so we also have the notion of the normal line. A normal line is, uh, is perpendicular to the tangent plane, right? So at each point you have a tangent plane, I'm not going to draw this, just not to mess up the picture, not to make it too heavy, but there is a tangent plane here, right? And also, but there's also a normal line. So it's perpendicular to the tangent plane. When something's perpendicular to the tangent plane at the point, we might as well say it's perpendicular to the surface, right? What else can it mean to be perpendicular to the surface? It just means being perpendicular to the tangent plane. Now, on this line, there are many vectors. You can take, if you have one vector on this line, you can take any multiple of this vector. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to, to specify 
a normal vector at each point, and we want to specify it in, with as little ambiguity as possible. So the way to get rid of the ambiguity, get rid of the redundancy, is to normalize the vector, to make it a unit vector. If you have any vector, it has certain magnitude, unless, you know, if it's non-zero, you can divide by the magnitude, and you get a vector of length one, or magnitude one. Such a vector is called unit vector. So, out of all the vectors along this normal line, we can say, let's take a, norm, a unit vector. The problem is that when you do that, you still have a small ambiguity. It is a much smaller ambiguity. Instead of infinitely many vectors, you end up with two. There are two possibilities. There is this, this one, but there is also one which goes in the opposite direction. Right? So it's kind of a mirror image of this one. And just by saying it's a unit vector, we can't uh, kill this redundancy. Both of these are bona fide um, uh, unit normal vectors to the surface. Uh, if you think about, you know, about this upper hemisphere, one of them sticks out, goes outside, and the other one goes inside, right? So, so there are these two choices at each point. At each point, there are two choices. And um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to make a choice at each point al along this entire surface so that this choice is continuous, smooth. In other words, we don't want to be in a situation where we choose a unit vector at this point to, be going, to go outside, outward, and then at the nearby point to make it go inside, right? That wouldn't be smooth. So when we talk about normal vector, unit normal vector field, we mean that we want it to vary in a smooth way. So that's what this n is, n of this formula. This n is the unit normal vector field. And then I will emphasize varying smoothly, smoothly. along M. Such a vector field is called orientation. Orientation. Okay? I would like to contrast this to the notion of orientation of a curve. In the case of a curve, if you have a curve going from point A to point B, we talked about its orientation as a direction along the curve. Okay? And if the curve, if the curve has boundary points, specifying orientation is the same as specifying which one is the initial point and which one is the end point. So here would, this would be the initial point, this would be the end point. If the curve does not have a boundary, for example, a circle, we could say it's counterclockwise or it's clockwise, right? But let's, uh, let's look at, uh, at this one, which has, which has endpoints, it has a boundary. In this case, by, an, by analogy to this, we observe that actually, in this case, there are also two possible orientations. We can go this way, or we can go that way. So there's a lot of similarity with the notion of orientation for curves and surfaces. The main difference is that orientation for a curve goes along the curve. You kind of flow, you go with the flow, so to speak. And here, you also go with the flow, but the point is that the flow goes across the surface, usually, right? You don't want to flow, you can't flow along the surface in some sense. Right? I suppose you can, in some, maybe, but it, it makes much more sense to flow across the surface. For example, as I explained, you could, have a, you could have a pipe, you know, and this would be a membrane which kind of covers, covers this pipe, and you would be measuring the amount of fluid which passes through it. So it's much more natural to talk about orientation across rather than along in the case of surfaces, unlike curves for which being going along means, means a lot more sense. Now, the, so this is, one, this is one important difference between orientations for curves and surfaces. There is a similarity, right? There's a similarity that in both cases there are two, are two choices. So here there are two choices. Here there are two choices. And in this case, there are also two choices. One indicated in white and one indicated in red. And if you think about it, once you choose it at one point, then basically you, 
there is no choice at nearby points because you have to vary it smoothly so you know it that nearby it will be like this, nearby will be like this, like this, like this. Because you don't allow jumps. If you don't allow jumps, once you know it at one point, once you specify it at one point of your surface, you know it everywhere. But, but then the question is, can we actually define it everywhere in, the, in, a, in a consistent way? And this is, here we kind of get surprised because in the case of a curve, there, is always, there are always two orientations. For any curve, you can always choose two orientations. One goes this way, one goes that way, right? But in the case of surfaces, there it actually exist surfaces which, which have none, which don't have any orientation. And, and this is actually kind of cool. Um, you must have heard about Möbius strip, right? Have you heard about Möbius strip? Yes. Okay, so here is a little, little demonstration for you. So, we need a close-up. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes I delay, so that's why I'm, uh, I'm saying it, and I'm, I'm waiting for a few seconds. Okay, so here's a, here's a surface. I mean, this is a surface. Um, and I colored it um, uh, in two ways. So, there's white side, on one side is white, and the other side is pink, okay? So, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a surface, I can make a, like glue a surface out of it in different ways. So for example, I can do glue it in this way, right? If I glue it in this way, it's like a cylinder. It's like a little cylinder. Uh, not so, uh, I mean, kind of very low height. And in this case, if you look, you can see that actually it's, it clearly has two sides, right? It clearly has two sides. There's an inner side and there's an outer side. One is red, one is pink, and one is white. So think, uh, when you talk about orientation, you can also think about in terms of Cho choosing the side of the surface. I was talking about vector sticking out, but once you have a vector sticking out, you have, you have the notion of what's outside and what's inside. So let's think that, let's say that if it sticks out this way, then that's the outside of the surface. And, and if it sticks out this way, then that's the, uh, that's, that would be, you know, that would, that, this would be the outside and that would be the inside. So it's like, you know, if you put your t-shirt inside out, this kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's a, no it's a clear notion inside or outside of a surface, right? So that's what we're talking about. Orientation is, the no, is saying which side we consider as inside and which one you consider as outside. Because of course, a priori, it's not clear. You can choose, um, you can make your choice, right? And sometimes you can have a t-shirt which actually looks even better if you wear it inside out. Inside out. <laughs> it kind of looks cool, right? But imagine you have a, you have a shirt which only has one side, a t-shirt which only has one side, right? So that would be difficult to wear. Now, but actually you can create such a, not necessarily a t-shirt, but you can cr create such a surface very easily by taking this same strip and gluing the ends in the up, kind of by twisting by, by 180 degrees, okay? If you do that, you say, okay, so let's say that this is the, this is the, out, this is the outside, right? But then you trace it, if you trace it, the outside, you trace it, you trace it, and then suddenly it becomes white, and when you make the full circle, you come back on the opposite side, right? So if this was outside, outside, it should be the notion that if we follow it, you know, on my, on my shirt, if I follow it everywhere, it's going to be on the same side always. I will never be able to jump on the other side. One would hope anyway. And uh, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? But here, you go, you make a full circle, and you come back on the opposite side, so that means this is outside, but also this is outside, right? So that means, but then which one is it? So it means at this point it's not defined. There is no, there is no global notion, there's no global notion of inside and outside. You see what I mean? So in this case, we will say that the surface is not orientable. And this is a really remarkable phenomenon. Again, in the case of curves, all curves are, are orientable. It's just that there is a redundancy. There are two possible, or ambiguity. There are two possible orientations. You have to make a choice. For surfaces, actually, we don't even have that luxury. There are many surfaces which are not orientable, for which you cannot consistently say which is inside and which is outside, and that's the, that's the example. Okay? Any questions? So in this case, if the surface is like this, there is no, no, there is no orientation. There is no unit vector that you can make which varies smoothly and gives it a, a, a normal vector at each point. Because, you know, if I were to give such a vector, let's say, again, here, the vector will be sticking out this way, but if I vary it smoothly, I would be forced 
to come out here on this side. So, so that means it becomes ambiguous. And like at this point, there is no, it, it, is simultaneous, it has to be simultaneously this and that. And that's not allowed, right? So it does not have a consistent orientation. So in the case of such a surface, this integral is actually not well defined. You cannot set up an integral of a vector field over a surface which is not orientable, which does not have this, uh, this, this type of orientation. In other words, the consistent notion of ins inside and outside. So we have to be aware of this. Now, the good news is that most surfaces are orientable. More surfaces that are of interest to us. For example, if we are thinking about, uh, about really a fluid flowing in the pipe, and you're thinking of something which is like a cover uh, at the end of the pipe, it is going to be orientable. So it's not really going, we're not going to be too handicapped by the fact that, by the fact that um, for non-orientable surfaces, this is not well defined. Most of this, all the surfaces we will consider in this class for sure will be orientable, okay? But we have to be aware of the fact that actually it's not, we should not take this for granted, that actually a surface that may not have an orient, a, 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 a particular, even one orientation. Of course, if it has one, it will have, it will have to have two, right? The point is that if n is one of them, the negative n will also such an object, also such an orientation. So it can't be that you have just one orientation. You either have none or you have exactly two, always. Okay? And in all of the cases which we will consider here, our surfaces will have two orientations. And this will give us a little bit of a headache because when, we, when I write now the Stokes formula, I will have to be very precise in specifying how are the orientations on, on the left and right hand sides so as to make, make the equation correct, okay? So let's go back to, let's go back to this. To this integral. So the integral is actually Let's suppose that it is orientable. So this is, <clears throat> this is important. It's not, it's not a given that the surface is orientable, but let us assume from now on that M is orientable. Orientable. That is, that is to say M has an orientation vector field, orientation vector field, N. And then it has necessarily two of them. It has two orientations, N and negative N. Okay, let's assume that. And so pick one, pick one. We will pick one. It's pick one orientation, which is what I call N. In this case, we have this integral. We have this double integral. Let me um, give me more, myself more space like this. So you have E dot ds, which can be defined by the formula here. I just, I just rewrite it, e dot n ds. Now, there are two choices. So if you take the second choice, the second choice means instead of n, you take negative n. So if we choose negative n, we just get minus of what we had before. What you, if, we take, if we choose the other orientation, this will just result in the overall sign. So in that sense, you can say, well, it's not such a huge ambiguity. You, you don't get sort of a totally different answer. You get something up to a sign. But, you know, it, it's not, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be uh, serious if we, in this course, we said, all our results were defined up to sign. We have to be precise. We have to be able to say, is it, you know, 10 or negative 10? Because uh, oftentimes, you know, your life depends on it to know it's positive or negative. So that's why, that's why we, we take this seriously and we say, 
the definition of such an integral has to include the orientation. So if you do a homework problem, it has to say the integral of the vector field over the surface with respect to which orientation. And then there is standard terminology. Standard terminology is, you can say, orientation is upward. Upward means that um, the, the vertical component of the vector field is positive. So the white orientation on that picture is upward. Or it could be downward. That would be the red one. And oftentimes, if we have a closed surface, for example, not the entire sphere, but say, uh, but, but say the, sorry, not the upper hemisphere, but the entire sphere, you could say outward or inward, which also has a clear meaning. OK, so let's pick one. How do we actually compute this? We compute it by parameterizing m, by choosing two auxiliary parameters, u and v. right? And then when we parameterize it, so this integral is, becomes, we can write it very concretely as follows. It's e dot r u cross r v over d, where d is a parameterizing, uh, d is a parameterizing uh, domain in, uh, on, the, on the plane, on the UV plane. Parameterizing domain in the two, on the plane of its coordinates u and v. What is r? So r is a vector which we get by combining the the three functions which parameterize our curve x of u v i plus y of u v j plus z of u, v, k. Right. So these are the three functions. You put them together into a vector, into a vector field. R sub u simply means that you take derivatives with respect to u. Maybe you write dx, du, i, plus, and so on. And likewise, R sub v means that you take dx, dv, i, plus, and so on. So once you have your parameterization, once you have your parameterization, you have this r, and you have r sub u by taking simply partial derivatives of these three functions with respect to u, and you have r sub v. So then you can just take the cross product. And when you take the cross product, you get another vector field, which you can then dot with your original vector field. This will give you a function, which we then, you then integrate over the parameterizing domain. And of course, the point here is that both the, the, the original integral and this integral are integrals over surfaces, but there's a huge difference. This surface is actually on the plane. It's flat. So by, by this formula, we express a complicated integral over a very complicated surface, which could be very curved, like a sphere or part of a sphere, as an integral over a domain uh, on the plane, which is flat. So that's the definition, which we talked about last time. And then in some special cases where um, for example, your surface is a graph of a function. We have some, uh, the formula simplifies. And we have various formulas which, allow, which uh, kind of give us a shortcut to the answer. OK? So finally, we are ready to, to state, um, to state the, um, the Stokes theorem by using this notion of a, by using this notion of a, of a surface integral. Okay, so let me draw this. Let me draw this one more time. So you have this our surface M, and the, and we have the boundary, the circle, the circle boundary, which I'll call B of M. So on the right-hand side of the Stokes formula, we will have a line integral of a vector field over this boundary. So we'll have a vector field, um, F, which will be defined in a three-dimensional space. In particular, will be defined on this entire surface. And on the right-hand side, we'll simply take 
the line integral of this vector field over the boundary. Okay? So this is something we learned before, so I don't have to say much about it. This is just the, what has become by now the usual thing, the line integral of a vector field. Which is, again, to calculate it, we need to parameterize the curve, and, and then there's a very simple formula which allows you to, do, to, to take this integral. And now, on the left-hand side, we are going to have an integral, which is a double integral, and it's going to be an integral over m. Okay? And then the, the integral, it will be the integral of another vector field, and that vector field will be nothing but the curl of f. Curl of f. So you have your vector field, and it appears on the right-hand side. But your, um, but on the left-hand side, you have another vector field. This is something which I was denoting by E in all my previous formulas. So you are, we have double integrals of, um, of a vector field E over a surface. But now take as E the curl of your original vector field which is given to you from the beginning, F. F is given, take its curl, that's another vector field, and take the integral of the curl. And so the remarkable statement is that, that you always have this equality. You have this equality of a double integral and a single integral over, over a surface and over the boundary of the surface. Now, what I have said is, is still incomplete. And the reason it's incomplete is that both of these integrals depend on choice of orientation. Did you have a question about this? Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, curl of f is, would, be, would be what I call here E. Right? Right. So I, I purposefully called this vector field E, and I called that vector field F. Because on the left-hand side, when we do the double integral, we are actually integrating not f, but curl f. So that's why I'm, I'm using a different notation here, so as not to confuse you. We are, not con we ha we are given the vector field f, but we are sticking that vector field on the right-hand side into a single integral, into a line integral, right? <coughs> Whereas on the left-hand side, we do curl. And curl is another vector field which we know how to calculate. And, and um, today we'll actually we'll actually see what the meaning of that, of that curl is, in a kind of a better meaning. We'll get a better explanation of what the meaning of this vector field is. Okay, so that's the formula. But, as I said, on both sides we have two integrals which, I, I, I explain, as I explained, requires the choice of orientation, right? So, in other words, depending on how I choose orientation on M, I will either get, I will get plus minus some answer. I will get some answer or it's negative. And if I want to pin it down, I have to say which orientation I should take. Both integrals are well defined. There is no canonical choice of orientation. Right? There's no canonical choice of orientation. So there are two possibilities and there are two possible answers. They differ by a sign. But I have to say which one I should take for this to make this well defined. Likewise, here, I also have two different answers. In the case at hand, I have this circle. I can choose orientation which goes you know, counterclockwise or clockwise, if you look from above. So again, there are two different answers, which differ by a sign. If I'm saying that these two things are equal to each other, I better be precise and say how the orientations should be defined so as to make this into an equality. Because if I make the wrong choices, instead of getting this formula, I'll get neg uh, this equal to negative of that. In other words, if I, would be, if I wanted to be careless about orientation, I would not be able to state this formula at all. I would, the best I could do, I would be able to say, this is equal to plus minus this. And, then I, and, the, and if I did that, I should be fired. So, we don't want this to happen. Well, maybe you do, but I don't. So, so that's why I'm going to explain how to choose orientation so that we don't have this ambiguity. And of course, the point is that it's, it, it, you probably guessed already because this is very similar to the, the way, to the problem which are already ar uh, arose when we talked about the Green's theorem, which is actually kind of a little brother of this Stokes theorem. We'll talk about it in a minute. 
In Green's theorem, there is also this issue of, of orientation. And the way we handled that was by saying that was the, follow, was the following. Let me do it here. So you see, in Green's theorem, we also have a two-dimensional region, but it was flat. This is flat. This is not flat. Well, I have drawn it on a flat blackboard, but 3D, you know, I, uh, I was just reading about this new movie, um, Avatar, you know, it's going to be in 3D. <laughs> so I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, maybe some years from now, these lectures like calculus will be given also in 3D. So you will all be wearing the school glasses and, uh, and you will actually see this three-dimensional, I will be able to draw three-dimensional surfaces. I should talk to Cameron about this. I'm sure he's a huge fan of multivariable calculus. So, or if he isn't, he should be because he uses a lot of uh, special effects. And of course, how can you do special effects if you don't use calculus? Anyway, so in Green's theorem, you have a region like this. And the way we handle this is we said, once you have this region, the orientation you define on the boundary is such that when you walk on the boundary, the region is to your left. Okay? If you walk on the boundary, the region is to your left. So it would be like this. It would be counterclockwise in this picture. So I would like to say the same. I would like to say that if I walk on this boundary, if somebody walks on this boundary, then the region should be to, uh, along the orientation, with respect to the orientation. The orientation should be such that as somebody walks along this boundary, the region itself, the surface, is to the left. But the question is, how do you expect that person to walk on this? There are two possibilities, right? It could be that they walk like this, or they could be walking from the other side of the blackboard. You see? A priori, there is no choice. I mean, there are two choices, a priori, right? There, are, there, is, no there is no canonical choice. There is no given choice. In the case of a plane, we do have an obvious, we, ha we do have an obvious orientation. We, ha we do have a special orientation. And the reason is the following. Because we, we c there is an orientation which kind of sticks out towards us. Another way to say it is that there is an orientation which we call K. We usually draw, so we draw this coordinate system, which is I, J, and then there is a K, which is obtained by the core screw rule, um, the, the orientation, the right-hand rule, whatever you call it. Remember this picture? The, the, this, is a, this was one of the, my fondest memories for the, of this class. <laughs> this, this discovery of this, of this visual aids, you know. The, the, this is how you show the normal. So the point is that, you see, you can't just say, since I can actually move this, you can al already appreciate the problem in giving it orientation. It could, the orientation could be like this, or it could be like this. But the point is, when we actually draw something on a two-dimensional plane, we look at it from a certain direction. We have to be looking at it from a certain direction. We either are on this side, and we're looking on this side, or we are there. And let me tell you, there's not a whole lot of space behind <laughs> that board, so we, we should be on this side, right? Once we are looking at it from this side, we can give it any coordinate system, any orientable coordinate system. And in fact, this is not even canonical either, but I can rotate it and so on. But whichever coordinate system, x, y, I choose, the cross product of the i and j will be, will be looking in this direction, will be sticking this way. So that's why when we have an, um, a region on the plane, we actually have a canonical orientation. And that's what we call vector k. k being the cross product of i and j in this order. First x, so this is a unit vector in the x direction. This is the unit vector in the y direction. We take the cross product in this order, right? And so that's what gives us this z, um, uh, the, the z axis, or, or the unit vector along the z axis. So we're kind of lucky in this, in this case. We don't, we don't have to make a choice. The choice is made by the, by the fact that we're actually observing it in a certain way. We're looking at this at this blackboard in a certain way. 
But if we have now a surface in a three-dimensional space, for example, I could just put this blackboard somewhere in the middle of this class, and some of you will be on one side, and some of you will be on the other side. So for some, some of you will be looking from one direction, some of them will be looking from the opposite direction. So for some of you, it will be one orientation. For some of them, it will be natural to take the other orientation. You see, so in general, there is a choice of orientation. But once you make that choice, if you make it like this, you can say, if a person walks so that their head is, you know, points in the right direction, up, then the, then the domain is on the left. Then it actually makes sense. So if somebody could be walking like this, th their head would be this way, right? And so they will have the region on their left. So that would be, the, the, we get the old rule. If on the other hand, I would just say, let's choose the other orientation, which goes in that direction, I would still have the notion of somebody walking on, along the boundary, but that person would be on this side, right? And then it would still make sense to say that the, that the, uh, the region is to their left, which would then mean the opposite direction. If, if you, well, you'd have to believe, trust me, that this is how it works, but you, you, can, you can just imagine it. If, it's, if, it was, if it were made of glass, you will see it, right? So the rule in general is like this. If a person is walking along this, pointing in the direction of the orientation, if this is your orientation, and you are, and you are, you're not upside down, you have to be, you know, oriented in the right way, your head should be above your feet, basically. <laughs> With respect to this orientation, I'll try to, I'll try to, uh, not to make too many, uh, jokes about this, but you, I'm sure you can, you can, uh, you can do them yourself. So if you walk this way, your, the surface should be to your left. So this is how it works. And if you were, if I chose a different orientation, which would be inward, then I would have to draw this little fellow pointing in this direction, and then it would have to walk so that the region is on to the, to the left, okay? So that's the rule. Is that clear? Okay, so this is it's pretty clear. So that's the rule I, ch I choose. And if I choose that, that rule, which it will give me a consistent formula, it will give me a choice. Whatever choice I take here, once I make the choice of orientation n, I get orientation on, on the boundary as well. And it is for these two choices that these two integrals will be equal to each other. So that's the statement of Stokes' theorem. Now, the next thing I would like to do is I would like to kind of try to demystify this formula because at the moment it looks, it looks pretty bizarre in a way because you have this strange, you have two different types of integrals. So one of them is of the vector field, the other one is this curl, okay? So I would like, what I would like to do is I would like to explain how this formula actually fits in this general principle which I talked about earlier. Okay? of which we have now seen several examples. So I would like to convince you that this formula is actually a special case of this general principle, just like the fundamental theorem of, uh, for line integrals and the Green's theorem. So that's the next thing that we're going to do. So in order to explain this, I would like to actually give a, a slightly more uh, um, precise formula for, for a surface integral. And so this is going to be a slightly long and, may, and, and somewhat boring calculation, tedious calculation. But bear with me because at the end of the calculation, I hope that I will, kind of, I will be able to demystify this, or demystify this formula, and you will see that really it is part of a, of a pattern, which is much more, um, how should I say, much more convincing. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to do is I want to go back to a general surface integral. Like this, a general. So here E doesn't have to be the curl. It doesn't have to be the curl. It could be uh, some vector field. And I would like to write a slightly more explicit formula for it, assuming that I have a parameterization. So let me recall that what I wrote on the, on the top of the, on the top 
in, that, in the top right corner there. I wrote that this is equal to the integral over D, the parameterizing domain of E dot RU cross RB. Where RU and RV, you, you have, well, the beginnings of RU and RV you have on that blackboard. So now I want to actually calculate RU cross RV for you, okay? So I'm going to calculate what RU cross RV is. So this is just the, um, the usual cross product. This is just the usual cross product where I put um, dx, um, du, dy, du, and dz, du in the first row. And I put dx, dv, dy, dv, and dz, dv in the second row, okay? So now I just open, I just, I just write down what it means. So, um, so let me just uh, start with I. So this is going to be uh, dy du, dz dv minus dy dv dz d, uh, du, this is times i, okay? Uh, maybe here uh, plus. So now j, so I have to look at this, and I have to remember the sign. So it's going to be uh, dz du. I, I'm, it's a little, it's going to take a little, uh, a little time, so, but you will like it when, I, when it's over, trust me. So it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile to, to do this calculation. Uh, dz d, uh, dv dx du j. You have to do it once to believe it and then after this a lot of things become simpler. Plus finally I have to do the k and the k is dx du dy dv minus dx dv dy du, okay? Check this, okay? Are you with me on this? Is this good? You can only, if you, if you agree then, you know, you will not have a chance to, to, uh, to re disagree with me later. You have to, this is your last chance, okay? So if we agree on this, have you ever seen this formula before? You're under oath. So, have you ever seen this formula before? What, does it, what is it called, this kind of expression? Come on. It starts with a J. It's a Jacobian, okay? It is a Jacobian for the coordinates Y and Z with respect to U and V. This is a Jacobian for the coordinates z and x with respect to u and v. And this is a Jacobian for x and y with respect to u and v. Is that, everybody agrees with that? So I actually can rewrite this in a compact, in a more compact way by using the notation which we, which we introduced when we talked about Jacobians. Okay, so this is a, the notation for the Jacobians is d, you put a del like this, and then you put y and z over del of x, y, uh, 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 y, z, uh, uv. This is a notation, this is a notation for the Jacobian, which we have used extensively about a month ago or so, okay? So this is times i. Plus, we have the Jacobian for z uh, x over u v j plus the Jacobian over x y u v 
and then you put k. So, so that's, this is actually the explicit formula for this cross product. And this cross product enters in the definition. Okay? So now let me actually take the, the, the dot product to, so that I get the entire expression. For this, I have to also say what is E. So let's say that E is AI plus BJ plus CK. Then, then what do I get? I get E dot RU cross RV, which is my integrand in the surface integral, is A times D times this Jacobian plus B Okay, so that's the formula. I, here is actually explicit formula for what you should integrate when you take double integral of a vector field. An explicit formula, which is written entirely in terms of the components of your original vector field and the Jacobians of the, of the coordinate change from UV to all possible pairs of coordinates amongst X, Y, Z. Now, how can you remember this without memorizing this formula? It's very easy. So first of all, you have A, B, C, right? These are the components of the original vector field. And then you also have X, Y, and Z, the three coordinates. So the, you have to remember the, the structure of the formula, that there are three terms. Each term corresponds to one of the three components of the vector field. And then you have to remember which Jacobian to put. You see, there are three different Jacobians. But there is also a subtle point, which is in the Jacobian, you also have to remember in which order you put the coordinates. You may remember from doing uh, double integrals by using general coordinate changes that if you switch the coordinates, the Jacobian gets a minus sign, right? Jacobian gets a minus sign. So here it's important that I put yz over uv and not zy over uv, right? So first thing you notice that first, that if you take a, the variables which get involved, so a corresponds to x. So to, to get the variables involved, you have to cross it out. So you see, you have A, Y, Z here. Then you have B with X, Z, and C with X, Y. So that the two coordinates which you take, which appear in front, together with the component of the vector field, are the remaining two components, right? So A is the X component. So the, the coordinates which are relevant to this term of the formula are Y and Z. And then you have to ask yourself in which order and the order should be a, what mathematicians call a cyclic order, which means this is first, this is second, this is third, and this is fourth, and so on. So it kind of goes in a circle. So for example, y and z have to appear in this order, y, z. But z and x should appear, you are at z. What's the next one? The next one is the first one. You kind of, it's a cyclic order. Okay, so it's like z, x. And then like uh, x, y is clear. So x, y, y, z, z, x. And then you put the remaining component of the vector field. So that's what the meaning of this formula is, okay? So that's the first thing we should agree on. That double integral can be written in this form, okay? But now, let's go back to Stokes' formula. In Stokes' formula, there is an additional complication, as if this formula was not complicated enough, right? We actually have to take the surface integral not of the vector field itself, but of, of its curl. So G, we have to do one more you know, cross product, right? But actually, the funny thing is that when you, do, when you do that cross product and you combine it with this stuff, which you can imagine is going to look horrible, right? Actually, it will look better in some sense. In other words, you will get something which will have a much more conceptual explanation. So let's do that. Let's do that because I promise that I will I promise that I will explain it to you, so let me, let me explain this to you. So, we're halfway there. What we need now is we need to take the, to apply this formula to the left-hand side of Stokes' theorem, where we are just doing it to the curl of the vector field and not to, ve to vector field uh, as before. So, if E is curl of F, then what are, 
what does it look like? So we have to again do this, i, j, k, and then we put d, d, x, d, d, y, d, d, z, and then we put p, q, r. <coughs> so what do we get? We get d, r, d, y, minus d, q, d, z, times i. Uh, plus dp dz minus dr dx plus dr dx minus dp dz. But please, uh, please check that I did it correctly. Um, the R, uh, the Z, uh, because if I mess if I mess up one term, then it will not come out right. So, uh, mm -hmm. the R, the X. Okay, good. Good, that's right. And in fact, for good reason, because this is expression in Green's theorem, right? So we know that Green's theorem actually is a special case of this when only this term shows up. That's right, dq, dx, and here dy. Exactly. Good. I think now is correct. So now I want to put this in here. In other words, this will be my A, and this will be my B, and this will be my C. Okay? So you, th you would think it will look awful. And in some sense, in some sense it will. But, but then I will explain another way to get that same expression in a much more, in a kind of a, a much more conceptual way, so to speak, okay? So that, and this will, at least for me, this, and I, I hope for you, this will demystify this expression and this, actually, and this result. Okay, so let, let me put this into this formula. And I really want to do it in real, in real time instead of showing you, showing it to you already written before because you know, if I show you, you would be like, okay, whatever. You know, there's some derivative, so he, he says it's, it works, then it works. But I want you to really follow me and to really see how it works. So dr dy minus, so, to, so please keep track of what I'm writing because as you see, I can make, I can make mistakes. So, but now I want to do one more thing, actually, to simplify, to, to, to kind of accelerate it slightly. At the end of the day, I'm going to integrate this, right? I'm going to integrate this. I'm not just taking this expression, I'm actually integrating this. And I'm integrating it with respect to du dv, right? So let me actually then multiply this by du dv. But if I do that, then this becomes a dy dz, right? Because remember, let me put it, let me write it here. Right? When we, when we did double integrals, this was the formula which we used. If we integrate, well, the way we did it was for x, y. We did it for dx, dy. But the same would apply if I, apply, if I do it for x, z, or y, or, or y, z, right? In other words, when we integrate a function in x and y, we said it can be written as an integral over u and v, but you have to insert this factor. Um, I'm sorry, I, this is not, doesn't look right, okay. What I mean is, of course, this. Right. So the way we wrote it is we said that when you have a double integral of some function f, this is equal to, right? But I'm, what I'm doing is just stripping it off the integral and I remove this function. I'm just saying that this is, this is really the identity which we used and we proved it, right? So what I'm going to do is that whenever I have this ratio, because I now multiply overall by du dv, I'm just going to replace this by dy dz. I'll replace this by dz dx, and I'll replace this by dx dy. 
Can I can I do that? Are you you agree that this is uh, this is this is okay, legitimate? Yeah. Okay. So this was the purpose. I'm just trying to remind you that this was the purpose of introducing this Jacobians in the first place because we wanted to replace things like dx, dy by du, dv. And we knew that this was the price to pay. We had to insert this factor. So I might as well replace this expression by this expression. And likewise for the remaining two summons. So this is a formula I'm going to use. And I'm going to now take this formula and say that A is, that is A, B, C are those components which I got from the curl. So now here's what it's going to look like. dy, dc plus. So B now, dp, dz minus d r d x. Um, dq dx minus dp dy. OK? Check that you, uh, that I didn't uh, shorthand you, shortchange you. So this is the formula, right? I just take each of these three components, q, d, v. So the easy way to check is that this should be y, z, y, z. This should be z, x, z, x. This should be x, y, x, y. And then it should be p, r, q, p, r, q. OK? So this is what I get. So this is what this expression stands for. When I integrate this, I have to take this, exp I have to, I'm integrating this expression. This is the left-hand side. This is the left-hand side. More precisely, if I put now the double integral over m, this is the left-hand side of Stokes. Of Stokes 10. And now, I want to write the right-hand side. And the right-hand side, of course, we know. We've known for a while. The right-hand side I recall that dr is dx i plus dy j plus dz k. <clears throat> and so f, f dr, and, I, and f is pq. Uh, I should have said it, but f is pqr, but uh, this is what I was using. So f is, f is pi plus qj plus rk, OK? So f dot dr is, of course, then just p dx plus q dy plus r dz. So the, the, the right-hand side is the integral over the boundary of m of p dx plus q dy plus r dz. This is actually a familiar expression for line integrals, right? For line integrals, we've known this all along, that line integrals could be written this way. Uh, if we did, it in, we did it often in two variables, then it would be just pdx plus qdy. For three variables, it's pdx plus qdy plus rdz. So what we are saying now, or what Stokes and others have taught us, is that this integral over the boundary is equal to that integral over the surface, OK? So how can we relate these two expressions? So there is actually a very simple way, which I already explained in the context of Green's theorem. And this involves uh, the notion of differential. So remember the, 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 remember the notion of remember the notion of differential of a function. The notion of differential of the function was like this. If f is a function, then its differential df is df dx, dx plus df dy, dy plus df dz. Right? You remember this? This is a differential. And now I would like to apply the same operation d to so this expression, OK? 
So now let's apply, so maybe I should have written, this is the right hand side of stocks. So now what I want to do is I want to apply D to PDX plus QDY plus RDZ. What am I going to get? The rule is very simple. Just apply it to the function which stands in front the same way you would apply it here when you can calculate the differential. And just uh, multiply by whatever it remains, for example, dx here. So let's apply it to the first one. What are we going to get? We're going to get Let's apply it to this, right? So let's take, it means that I take the differential of P. Let me do it slowly. So dPA dx and then plus dQ dy plus dr dz. So what is dp? What is dp? dp is dp dx dx plus dp dy dy plus dp dz dz. Right? And now I have to multiply this by dx. So let me just put it here. So I have dx dx, dy dx, ctx. Right? This is what the first term will give me. I just take the differential dp and I multiply by dx. So there is always this dx. But otherwise, it's exactly the terms that I get in the differential. Is that clear? Any questions? That's the expression. Let me do the second time, dq. So it's going to be dp dx dx plus, sorry, d, d, dq plus dq dy dy plus dq dz dz. Let me open the brackets. When I open the brackets, I have to put dz here, dz here, and here I have two dz's actually. Okay? dy, right, sorry. <laughs> I'm already jumping to the, to the last line, dy. So now the last line, dr dx dx plus dr dy. Let me leave some space for it. dr, dy, dy, plus dr, dz, dz. Let me open the brackets. dz, dz, dz. OK, now we're almost there. So first of all, if you have the same variable twice, you have to get rid of it. I already explained it once. Because if you have two coordinates which are not independent from each other, they, they, you cannot think of them as two new coordinates, right? In other words, the area which they, of the parallelogram which they span is zero. So this has to go. This has to go. And this has to go. So I had nine terms, of which only six terms will survive. And I claim that these six terms will be equal to this. So the six terms here. OK? So let's check that. Let's start with x, y. dx, dy. Where do I have dx, dy? I have dx, dy here. And I have dq, dx. And I have dy, dx. But remember, as we discussed before, if you have dy, dx, it's the same as dx dy, but you have to put a minus sign. So you get minus dp dy. dq dx minus dp dy. Voila. Okay? 
I hope the rest works as well. As the... I'll return to this issue of switching and getting the sign in a minute, but I just want to convince you that, that we get the right formula. Okay, next is dy dz. So here's dz dy, here's dy dz. dr dy, dq dz, but we have to switch them here so you get a minus sign, which is correct. And finally, dz dx, oof, I'm not underlying the right one, this one, dz dx, so this is dz dx. And this is dz dx. dz dx, you get dp dz. And here you get them in the wrong order. So you have to put a minus sign, minus dr dx. It works, right? So this very complicated formula, this very complicated formula, which I got by this very long and tedious calculation, is nothing but d of p dx plus q dy plus r dz, right? This is what it is. And now I can rewrite Stokes' formula in a much nicer way. much nicer way by using this operation. <coughs> Namely, the left-hand side is just PDX plus QDY plus RDZ over the boundary of M. And the left-hand side is the integral of d of this p dx plus q dy plus r g z over m, where the, this differential d is understood in the way I explained, in the way I have explained. Right? So this, this is what it boils down to. And certainly now, it looks much more um, beautiful. There are no curls, there are no ad hoc definitions of, source of integrals and stuff like this. You see a very clear pattern. Let me call this omega. And this is the integral of omega over b of m. And this is the integral, a double integral of d omega over m. Where d now acquires very concrete meaning as this, as this operation. Okay? So this is the general principle which I have been invoking throughout these lectures. And I was trying to, I, I told you that I will explain that all of these formulas that we are studying in this, in this course, in this part of this course, can be thought of as just special cases of this general formula. And now I can make it much more precise in this particular case. And you can see that this is how it works. Okay? Any questions about this? Yes. Do we have to worry about simply connected regions? Do we have to worry about simply connected regions? At this moment, no. So the simply connectedness shows up in, um, when we, when we de de um, try to determine whether a given vector field is um, conservative, right? Whether on the plane, if given a vector field, you try to see whether it is conservative and then you want to find the potential function, right? So at that moment, we have to worry about this. But this issue of uh, simply connectedness is sort of one l dimension lower. It has to do rather with fundamental theorem for line integrals than Stokes theorem, you see, because in that issue there, there, there was no, it, it was about finding line integrals. So here, no. So this issue, the short answer is no. We don't have to worry about this. Any orientable. Smooth orientable surface, right. Smooth orientable surface with a boundary. That's right, yes. So this is a very powerful, this is a par very powerful equation. Now, this derivation that I have given you, you're not, you're not responsible for it. In other words, it's not going to be on the exam and so on. 
I just wanted to explain for you so, so that you can understand a more conceptual way of, uh, of, of sort of viewing and appreciating these formulas, okay? And I think that really clarifies a great deal. Now, going back to, going back to what we have to, what you have to know and you, you, which, what you are responsible for, I want to give you an example. I want to give you an example of the application of, of, of the Stokes formula, which is very similar to what you will have on your, on your homework for this, uh, for this lecture, okay? So example is actually, is, ex is actually from the book, it's 16.8.8. .8. So you are given the vector field F, which is e to the negative xi plus e to the xj plus e to the zk. And you're supposed, you're asked to evaluate line integral of this integral, of this vector field over a triangle which is given by the, which is a part of the plane 2x plus y plus 2z equals 2, which is contained in the first octant, which is like for positive x, y, and z. So what it looks like is like this. Here you have 1, here you have 2, and here you have 1. And it's this triangle. This is a triangle which is a, this is a triangle of intersection of this plane, this plane, with, with um, uh, three coordinate planes. You see, because, for example, you can put, if you put y and z equal 0, you get x equal 1. If you put x and z equal 0, you get y equal 2, and then z equal 1. So this is x, y, z. Okay? So you are supposed to evaluate this integral, which is fine. It's not, um, it's not too complicated. What you need to do is you, ha you break it in, ah, you have to say which orientation, okay? So I have to be careful, right? So the orientation is counterclockwise, like this. So you can evaluate by breaking into three pieces, by parameterizing each of these line segments, right? and then just doing this line integrals. But it's going to take a while because you're doing, you have to do three different integrals. You have to parameterize, so the, you know, it's, it, there's some work involved. So what, what Stokes' theorem does, it, it gives you a shortcut to this. It allows you to evaluate this integral in a much more uh, direct way because you realize that, that this curve is actually the boundary of the surface. This will be our M. And so, by using Stokes' theorem, you can actually re rewrite this as, a, as an integral over M of curl of F dot ds. So, I'm not going to use any of this fancy machinery. I'm just going to use a straightforward the formula the way it is written in the book. Curl F dot ds. So, instead of doing this integral, we might as well do this integral, okay? And in fact, it is a very good idea because curl f is not exactly zero. So that would be like the, the maybe the first example for you would be to, I could g write this in such a way that the curl is zero, right? And then you actually um, say, okay, so uh, you don't have to calculate anything, right? So in this particular case, it's, not al it's almost zero. There is one component. If I calculate it correctly, it is e to the x times k. Right, because this one, you, do, you take derivative with respect to y and z. Here you take respect to x and z, so this is what gives you that. And here you take derivative to x and y, so th they disappear. So it's almost zero. If it were zero, you just get zero, right? So that's already, that. no matter how complicated this curve is, if the curl of the vector field is zero, you will actually get zero. So that's a wonderful application of, of this result where you can calculate the integral very quickly without any, doing any calculation. Here it's almost zero. So we, what we need to do is we need to evaluate the surface integral of this vector field. 
Okay? So for this, we have to choose, uh, uh, we have to use the formula. And the formula is that in this case, you can say that this is, um, this plane is a graph of a function. You can write it as z equals 1 minus x minus 1 half y. Let's call this g of x, y. And then we know that if you have a vector field E, which is A, B, C, or maybe, okay, let's call it PQR because I think this is the way I wrote it before, then the surface integral of E dot ds in such a case is equal to double integral over the base over the domain in x and y, where here you put p minus p dg dx minus q dg dy plus r. Right? Remember this formula? Right? So in this case, you only have p and q are 0, so you only have r, which is equal to the e to the x. And so you end up with a double integral of e to the x dx dy over the triangle on the plane, which is the, which is the, uh, the projection of this triangle onto the xy plane. So it has x coordinate 1 at this endpoint and y coordinate 2 at this end. And this is your d. Okay? So then this is very easy to calculate. So I'm actually out of time, so I stop here. And uh, we'll continue on Thursday. <laughs>